Good morning and welcome. We're glad you're here. Welcome in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We welcome you as you would welcome him. And if you are new to us, please sign the guest book at the back and help us to get to know you and become better acquainted. I want to call your attention to the yellow insert and bulletin with all the announcements. Uh, particularly, I want to share the sorrow of the Creelan family upon the death of Robert Creelan. Um, that family will be here for a private interment service in our memorial garden on September 12th. I don't know what other plans are being made at this point. I think they are hoping to keep things low key. We'll, we'll announce them uh, once the formal announcements or the formal plans are in place. Note the announcement about the nominating committee. We're gearing up to begin our search and request for new officers. If you have suggestions, please pass them along to those who are listed here. Also, I'm pleased to report that we were able to fill one vacancy in the church school faculty for this uh, year, and uh, that's always a wonderful uh, achievement. Uh, Amy Mazakevich will be teaching with Jenny Griffin. I think that's pre-K level, so we're very happy that Amy has responded. We have one more class to, to take care of and hope I can report that that is being uh, handled in an upcoming Sunday. Fall schedule begins. The, the uh, summer hastens on and just a few weeks, uh, a little less than a month, we will be returning to one service at 10 o'clock here in the sanctuary. That's Sunday, September 13th. Uh, we'll have a day, the bagel breakfast that some of you look for in the summer will happen that day as a way of celebrating our reunifications or our homecoming. So take note of that uh, and plan accordingly. Uh, there is an announcement under the calendar that, uh, that there's a Christian Ed team meeting. That's left over from last week, so that is not, uh, not relevant uh, in the calendar portion. But again, we welcome you as we would welcome Christ himself, and uh, let us worship God. Please join me now in the call to worship. Here in this place, new light is streaming. The better it is, the lost and forsaken. Here in this place, we yearn for your face above. The better it is, the proud and strong. Here in this place, a song inspires and a word instructs. Now is the day, now is the time for worship and praise. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs>
better confess our sins. See what I did wrong. Eternal God, our Judge and Redeemer, we confess that we have tried to hide from you, for we have done wrong. We have lived for ourselves and apart from you. We have turned from our neighbors and refused to bear the burdens of others. We have ignored the pain of the world and passed by the hungry, the poor, and the oppressed. In your great mercy, forgive our sins and free us from selfishness, that we may choose your will and obey your commandments. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Jesus Christ, it says in Scripture, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He has forgiven us yesterday, today he promises to do the same, and it's our blessed confidence that tomorrow he will lead us to new life and save us once more from our sins. Sisters and brothers, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. Thank you.
well because today is your birthday. Give me a good three days. Happy birthday. Linda. Linda. Grace. Grace. Miriam. Hopper. Laura. Dave. Carson.
practice is to select hands, and I see a hand already from Richard Schneider. Uh, 410. 410. God is calling through the whisper.
David Kohler at Sloan Kettering. Okay, thank you. And tell him again, we send our prayers and love in Christ. Yeah, Cindy? Um, we'll be traveling next week with Keaton back down to the uh, National Institutes of Health. So we're going to have some testing done. So it's prayer that everything can be done. Going back to Houston? No, we'll be in the best Maryland. The best of Maryland this time. Well, yeah. We stand with you as you travel, and uh, we hope for a wonderful outcome. And a couple of joys. My dad is in town visiting. Tori finished her first semester at nursing school with excellent grades, and we take Maddie away next weekend for her first semester at Scott College. There you go. Okay. Time of transition. Yes. But welcome, and uh, so good to see you. Yes. yes. My niece is family again. Um, it does. She's got all the tensions and financial problems. Her father was Bobby is only just going to see to make it after what from the island to make it after a few weeks. And the family just that lengthy show. We pray for their peace. Exactly. Let us unite our hearts and minds in prayer. Let us pray. Eternal God, in this world of trouble and need, but also opportunity and wonder, we look to you. For you are the giver of daily bread. You whisper, you suggest, you invite, you call on us to present our concerns and our prayers to you. And we thank you that you are able to do mighty things and to deliver us from every evil and every worry. We pray for the church this morning. Help us in our efforts to discern the mind of Christ, to know you and love you and serve you, and to follow where you lead. Help us to walk in your way each day. O oh God of abundant grace, hear our prayer. We pray for those that have been mentioned this morning. And we ask that you would watch over those that are known only in our hearts. Show them your mercy and show your grace to the nations. Help us as a church to continue to be committed zealously to feeding the hungry, redeeming the captives, and establishing justice for all. We pray for this community. It's summertime in the Hamptons, and everyone is eager and sometimes in a hurry just to have a good time. Remind us that the peace, your peace that passes all understanding and that our ultimate good time is being within you and your grace. We pray for loved ones, pour out your blessing on all those who are suffering. Give them long lives to enjoy your goodness Generous God, as you provide for us each day, nourish and strengthen us in faith and faithfulness so that we may share your grace in a hungry world through Jesus Christ, the bread of life, who teaches us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us to stay our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we prepare to give our gifts today, I'd like to ask our colleague, my colleague, Will Roselak, our organist and director of music, to offer a minute permission about the upcoming music programs and the forget, ask for his forgiveness for the misspelling of his name in the bulletin today. <laughs> you got all the right letters, but uh, you didn't forget it. This morning, I would like to talk to you a bit about uh, some opportunities that we have uh, that are being offered by our music ministry this month. Um, this coming Saturday, August 22nd, from 11 a.m. to noon. We are hosting a community sing-in, which, uh, which will be held right here in our main sanctuary. Uh, a sing-in is essentially a big sing-along with a major core work. Um, 
Um, and under the direction of uh, guest composer and conductor Cortland Matthews, we will sing for his requiem, which is a work that might be familiar to many of you. If not, it's a great piece you should come and sing it. Um, we'll provide scores, uh, and there will be uh, refreshments and coffee to follow this event. So please bring your friends. Um, all are welcome. Uh, we have a short program for children in grades 3 to 8 being offered from 10.30 a.m. to noon on August 24th, 25th, and 26th. Uh, it'll take place here at the church. Um, uh, this camp will cover the basics of proper vocal technique, basic music theory, and it's a great way for children to learn how to work together in the joyful noise. Um, and more so geared towards adults and teens, we're also offering a fundamentals of music theory course that will run from 7 to 8 p.m. on August 24th, 26th, 31st, and September 2nd. I know that's a, a lot to remember, but um, luckily all this will be online on the church's website. Um, you can go to www.westhamptonpresbyterian.org slash music dash program. Good luck. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to talk to me afterwards. Um, you'll also see some of these little cards in the back of the um, kids camp. There's also posters you'll see around town. You can't miss that face, it's a four Um Also, uh, um, we'll have registration forms for all these things in the office. And uh, feel free to shoot me an email. It's just williamroslack at gmail.com. R-O-S-L-A-K. Um, and on a side note, if you uh, have any useful singing during our church year, feel free to join our choir. It's open to everyone. Um, and we have a great time. So with that, let us get our gifts.
way back when I was young, melancholia. He's not the only one to choose this desperate act to end it all. David Duerson, who played for the Chicago Bears, did the same thing. Died the same way. Wanted to preserve his brain for the research going on into the lives of former football players, professional football players in particular. I watched a documentary not long ago with Brian Gumbel of Real Sports where he profiled, profiled the lives of the Chicago Bears that their team of 1985, the one that won the Super Bowl, and made Chicago go crazy in delirium and delight. A few of those bears, like Gary Fensick, a strong safety, has, have been very successful. But so many of the others are hurting and suffering, walking collections, uh, multiple injuries. William Perry, they used to call, nickname him the refrigerator, He's a fan favorite. He's now hobbled. He can barely walk. Jim McMahon, the zany quarterback, suffers from high anxiety and loss of focus. He'll drive off to a destination and then in the middle of his trip lose focus on where he's going. His illness results from multiple concussions. The program ends with the legendary co coach, Mike Ditka, wondering aloud if he or Brian Gumbel would allow his child or grandchild to play football. The question is ominous. I played football, so I can speak about this today. I played. I played in junior high, or what's now called middle school. I played in high school. I played in college. I played in a Division III school, which offers no scholarships, and a place where I was recruited by a coach who I now look back was nothing short of maniacal. <laughs> I have seen the fights, like the one that put Geno Smith of the Jets on the disabled list for three months. In fact, on a particularly hot afternoon, and that being here in August, this is when our preseason would start, our practices would start. I got into a got into it, as we called it, with a, in, a, in the midst of a frenzy workout. I got into it with a defensive lineman named Paul Ebersole from I think it was from Hazard, Kentucky. He, he was known for chewing tobacco while he played and practiced. How he did that, I'll never know. But I'll tell you this: it did nothing for his breath. <laughs> The fight itself was over before it started. It's so foolish if you're a football player to try to start a fight because you end up using your hands to hit the other player's helmet. So you know what gets hurt the most? Yeah. Your hands. I digress. I did see an entire game dissolve one time into a, a furious and fierce fight, a violent battle. The opposing teams, there was just chaos on the field. Referees were trying to separate players, and it was uh, bedlam. The opposing team's band director, I'm going to use this in a sermon illustration, forgive me if I've said it before, but I thought this was a stroke of genius. He instructed the band to stand and start playing the Star Spangled Banner, our national anthem, but it had more effect on the fans and then get on the team, the fighting continued. I've also seen manipulation and seen simple mean-spiritedness on the football field. In middle school, a father that I know paid his son $5 a week to go out for football in hopes that the game would make a man out of him. Now $5 a week in the early 1960s, not bad. I have seen dirty play, which is designed to hurt your opponent, not only defeat him, but take him out, as the saying goes. I was fortunate to endure no serious injuries except for a separated shoulder. I didn't see stars. That's what they called it. It was a euphemism for getting there. Well, the other one they used, oh, you just got your bell rung. <laughs> Go over the sideline, get some smelling salts. You'll be okay and get back in there. This is not a sport for babies. 
is what I was told. I did suffer from hurt pride when in the course of two weeks we were in college, we were defeated twice by scores of 50 to 21 and 50 to nothing. 100 points in two, in two games, you give up. We finally had a winning season my senior year, but I was already drifting away. I had discovered the capacity to think. <laughs> and when we played Randolph Macon in, in Virginia, a wonderful school, we had free time before the game just to get our heads together. I went to the library. I went to the library and managed to get in some important reading. The long bus ride home was hardly a place or time for study, especially after a terrible loss. But all in all, football in its place in the schools and as a culture in and of itself is a given. It's taken for granted. It's become, if you, in case you haven't been paying attention, a big business, where the coach at many Division I schools is the highest paid person on campus. And the revenue, well, it's a flat college football. It's a financial juggernaut. The revenue generated from games helps the academic budget of every department. <coughs> now on Sundays, professionals play, and a friend of mine bragged about seeing multiple games on a weekend. Of course, when I was in college, I would miss church to drive to Atlanta to see the Falcons play, the first game I ever saw, the great Dick Buckus and the Chicago Bears. Although in retrospect, I would have been much better off if I would stayed home and gone to worship in Sunday school. These days I wonder, and I use this wonderful Sunday in August to ask you to wonder with me, in particular after a player at Shore and Wading River died in a game last fall. I wonder after millions of dollars are generated by a fan base, fan by the way is short for fanatic, I wonder if after a millions of dollars to pay outrageous ticket prices to watch what is at its essence a very violent game. I wonder after friends are hobbled by a lifetime of injuries and after we are just now coming to understand the debilitating effects of getting hit in the head multiple times. I'm beginning to question what we used to take for granted as a normal part of living, the football game. And I wonder what you think Junior Seau would tell us if he could speak. What does his death tell us as we witness the run to a new season? What is Geno Smith thinking behind a broken jaw which has sidelined him for three months? from a hit in the locker room of all places. The questions are many. Is it just a game, or has it morphed into something more? Something more serious or competitive and desperate? Are we, for the sake of entertainment, risking people's lives in order to get a football into an end zone? And are we developing new junior sales in 2015 as coaches tell their players to run faster, hit hard, and out tough any and all opponents. What does Junior's suicide bequeath besides a posthumous entry into the Hall of Fame and a speech by his daughter not allowed, but yet published on the front page of the sports section of the New York Times? I wonder, and so should the church wonder, what is the zeal for that sport Tell us about ourselves. The Sermon on the Mount stands in stark contradiction to the conscience of the gridiron, and it raises questions when I read it with the football helmet on. Think about it. Instead of knocking your opponent's head off, you hear, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Instead of the swagger of the victor, you hear, Blessed are the peacemakers. They will be called children of God. Instead of brutalized who are unable to rise from their concession, concussion caused depressions and mental illness, you, 
you hear, blessed are the merciful, but they shall receive mercy. Instead of the idolization of stars, Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The more we know about the results of endless hits to the head, the more it's time to raise a few questions. The more we know about the condition of Junior Seau and others like him, the more we need, I believe, to discuss what it is his case calls us to do. There's a shadow side in this sport we flock to. I see the hurt and the injuries. And as if I hear Junior saying, enough, if we cannot make it less violent, less desperately competitive, less damaging to body and mind, if not spirit, then we should blow the whistle. The way that Rome defined in the sport of gladiators met its demise. If Junior could speak, what would he say to us? Well, Jesus Christ does speak. And his words call into question our fanaticisms. One of the college players I respected, and whom I, with whom I lost touch, I was just back in Tennessee, and I was thinking of all the people. He's a very athletic tackle from Hollywood, Florida, named Larry McDowell. I knew him well because I knew him off the field as well as on. Larry was asthmatic and often had breathing problems. I was his residence advisor in the athletic dorm, which prepared me for ministry, believe it or not. Being an RA in the athletic dorm. That's another sermon. No, that's another sermon series. I was his RA. But in one game, Larry was peeling around to block someone on a punt return. I think we were playing another Virginia team. It may have been Hampton, Sydney, or Henry and Henry. I can't remember. But I do remember this. Larry peeled around in a perfectly legal block. Perfectly legal block. The other guy didn't see him coming. He flattened the opposing player, hitting him so hard that he simply said, lay there motionless. We, of course, were proud of our teammates' fierce hit, his speed, his one-on-one -on -one triumph. Great hit, Larry. High fives, back slaps, all right. Great hit, Larry McDowell. You're the man. The other guy, though, didn't move. And soon the athletic trainers and the team physicians from both sides of the field were huddled around him. A stretcher was brought from the local ambulance which attended each game. And what does it tell you that so many medical people must be on hand in support of a football game? What does it tell you, although I'm proud to report, Dr. John Betchman has just, who grew up in West Hampton Beach, has just been appointed the neurologist for the Oakland Raiders football team. Great hit, Larry, we shouted. Then came the good sport applause when the, his opponent, still motionless, was carted off to the hospital. That was the end of the story. Or was it? I imagine, I just imagine, that there's an ex-football player along the from some Division III college in Virginia, who, if he's still alive, has recurring headaches. And if he's in his 60s like I am, he gets impatient easily and is often distracted by little annoyances that magnify and become large. And he's unable to concentrate. I imagine he might be somewhere and has no memory of the powerful collision that left him almost paralyzed on a football field in Tennessee. I don't know. But if Junior Seau could speak, he would remind us of the results of too many hits to the head. And he would remind us, if he could, that the term
term football safety has to be more than just an oxymoron. I dream of a day when the only time we say great hit, Larry, is when we are watching a baseball game. And I dream of a day when children and youth have committed the Sermon on the Mount to memory and have forgotten about the mad quest that we see in our culture to always be number one. I dream of a day when our obsessions give way to the Sermon on the Mount. And I dream of a day when, with God's help, the junior seahouse of this world will live a long and healthy life, enjoying their off-key voices to their church's choirs, to the glory of God. I repeat that. I dream of the day when, with God's help, the junior seahouse of this world will live long and healthy lives to the glory of God. Amen mm -hmm. and amen. Please rise with me and let us affirm our faith. <laughs> Together, in gratitude to God, in God by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives, even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth, praying, Come, Lord Jesus. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death 